All right, so tonight I'm going to do something different for me. It's different for me. I don't, I don't have any slides, but I got a lot of words here in front of me. Um, something I did in 2020 and 2021 was I did a page by page read through the entire Bible. Just morning and evening, I just sat down and did it. So sometimes it was reading a lot, sometimes it was reading a little. Uh, in 2020, I had an interesting Bible that somebody gave me a couple years ago. It's called the Reader's Bible. Uh, there is no, there's chapter headings, but no verse breaks. So it's almost like reading a novel. It's an interesting way to read the Bible. And the author did at least put in there every now and then when there's a, a verse or a concept that aligns with something else that's in somewhere else in scripture, they put that out there in blue. So every now and then you get these little blue paragraphs in there. But it was a very interesting way to read the Bible. I enjoyed that. Uh, so in 2021, I decided not to do that again. I decided to use my Bible. This Bible I've had for over 30 years, so it has a lot of notes. And it's a regular study Bible, so I was able to go through. I was able to look back and see notes that I've taken years and years ago. Sometimes I put a date in there. I don't have any idea why I put the date, you know, but it meant something at the time. So I went through that. But over the course of all that, you find these um, events, and I don't want to call them stories because if you use, and I'll say this again later, if you tell them, if DJ knows that there are stories and he talks about stories in the Bible, they get what stories are, and that's exactly what they become. This is, and I'll say this again, it's a Jewish history book written by Jews about a Jewish Messiah. It's a history book. All right, so, so some of those events that took place in history, I'm not a real history buff, but some of those events really, some of them, because a couple of them are kind of funny, but some of them are very serious, and some of them are even kind of sickening. So what I did was I carved out five or six of the top, top few that I wanted to look at, and I did a little homework on some of them because I didn't have enough context about some of them. And then I went through and I picked out some of the standalone verses that people use that really annoy me when they use them. <laughs> they mean well, but, I, I, but you'll see when I get there. So anyway, let's take our first crack at uh, Galatians 3. Galatians 3, we're going to be in uh, verse 27 and 28. For as many of you, you're there yet? Well, not yet. Come on, Mark. <laughs> what is it on page 1784. <laughs> what? Mine is too. Really? I just called that out. <laughs> okay, so. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all in one, one in Christ Jesus. So, neither Jew or Gentile, nor male or female. All right. Um, is this Bible in line with the new woke culture and gender dysphoria? No. Satan is a great deceiver, and while it looks like we have a blanket statement here that there is no male and female, obviously that is not the case. Satan wants nothing more th than to remove our understanding of these roles, and is currently doing a very good job. A great quote by a man I named Al Mohler, I uh, don't know, I was doing some research and his name popped up as a footnote, and he says, anyone holding a traditional biblical understanding of human sexuality is now simply out of bounds in contemporary society. We are simply out of bounds in contemporary society. So, uh, as Jen Pisaki would say, I'll circle back to you on our target verse, but I want us to, to be mindful. Uh, this thought process that society is embracing is driven more by the futile thinking of a depraved mind. There is no logic or rationale within some of these people. And the definition of futile is incapable of producing any useful results or pointless. And that's exactly where these people are coming from. They have, they're incapable of producing any results other than just more depraved minds. So a good place to land regarding human sexuality, let's go to Romans 1. This 
This is probably the single chapter that um, a pastor would get put in prison for before too long. This would be a character that is hate speech. We're going to look at verse 21, 24, 26, 28. Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became, here's that word again, futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Our current social media, societal mindset, sorry, is falling headlong into this concept of being a debased mind, a reprobate and unprincipled person. So in there, we looked at those verses, and they want to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Their women's exchanged a natural use for what is against nature. And God gave them over to a debased mind. And I have a note in my margins. Here's one of the notes I made uh, from long, long ago. And I remember where this was, Pastor Billingsley from Michelle. Sin is progressive. Sin is progressive. And I clearly, clearly recall my progressively sinful lifestyle when I was in that that mode. But clearly God has made male and female. So the confusion is a function of living in a fallen and depraved world, and indeed we are totally depraved. Another quote from a man, uh, Anthony Hokima. This is interesting. The corruption of original sin extends to every aspect of human nature, to one's reason and will, as well as to one's appetites and impulses. Yes, we have a sinful nature. So some have used our target verse, Galatians 3, 27 and 28, to erase roles and identities and distinctions so as to remove or blur the lines of what is really being said and just who it is that's being defined. Uh, scripture says in Romans 10, 11, 13, 11 through 13, if you want to go there, you can. Just a couple pages to the right. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So Paul says there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. And when you see the word Greek, think Gentile. Okay, so there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Whether slave or free, male or female, all have equal access to share in the salvation that comes to us by our faith in Christ. So Paul gets it even broader in Colossians 3, 10, and 11, and I'll read it for you. The implication here is you, you have put on a new man who is renewed, regenerated in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek, or Gentile, where there is neither Gentile or a Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, you know, or male and female if you want to put that in there, but Christ is all and in all. So we need to always bring context into our view. So in our targeted verse, Galatians 3, 27, 28, we, that we started opened with, it's not that there is distinctions between all groups. Paul says there are no distinctions. In Christ, they are all transcend, transcended. So, and a little note here, I wanted to look up, it says there in... Um, Colossians 3.11, there is neither Greek, Gentile, or Jew, circumcised, barbarian, comma, Scythian. And I want to know who were the Scythians, because it just said barbarians in front of that. I looked it up, and the barbarian, the Scythians were a lowest class. I know you could have a lower class than a barbarian. They were the lowest class of barbarian nomads, and not trying to score political here, but they were Russians. Just saying. So for the cherry pickers of Scripture who want to make a case against the authority of God and His Word and twist it for their own affections, we stand in derision among them, holding the truth of God's words. And again, I'm going to repeat that quote. Anyone holding the traditional biblical understanding of human sexuality is now simply out of bounds in contemporary society. So uh, this next Scripture group I picked out is uh, going to be in... 
It's a little awkward and kind of a strange one, but we cannot should and not shy away from any particular word in Scripture. And I've always found this uh, passage a bit strange. So turn to 1 Samuel 18. So I have, I'm going to get there first, sorry about that. For Samuel 18, I can find it. Okay, First Samuel 18. So it's a gross over, I have three uh, headings in my Bible over chapter 18, and it, when we go through these, there's, these Old Testament events sometimes take a lot of chapters to make them unfold, and we don't have time to go through all that. So as a highlight for what 18 is, I have three headings. David's relationship with Jonathan, David's relationship with Saul, and David's marriage. So a gross overview, Saul is increasingly afraid of David. It says in verse 18, Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Saul promises his daughter Merab to David and then gives her away to another man. Then Saul finds out his daughter Michal loves David, so he plots against David again. Marry Michal and be the king's son-in-law is his proposal. So David feels unworthy and admits that he does not have the bride price or the dowry to be able to pick up the king's daughter. So Saul's thinking, or hoping, actually, that David would fall at the hands of the Philistines. So look at verse 25. And Saul, in speaking with his servants, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So he thought he was going to throw David to the wolves. Send him out to conquer the Philistines. He dies. Saul's happy ever after. Look at verse 27. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. All right, so David kills two hundred men in the Philistine, of the Philistines. And there's an unfortunate visual in there for me. You know, it's just kind of a really pretty bizarre thing to do, right? And I was thinking... What would McCall say? Would she go to dad and say, like, that's it? That's the best you can do? I'm worth 100 pieces of male anatomy? And he supersized it and brings you 200? And for that, you're going to give me away? <laughs> Just one of those things you think of. I, I did anyway. So digging this is out, it, 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 there's a lot more here than just meets the eye, I think. So um, foreskin is listed 13 times, be it single or plural, six and seven times respectively. So at the root of it, it's defined as an act of submission under the law. But it's an outward submission, an outward form, and is not always in line with the inward attitude. So it's used simply to imply or drive obedience, obedience of the heart. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, Therefore, circumcision the foreskin of your heart, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and be stiff-necked no longer. Deuteronomy 36, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So the process is called circumcision. It's used 26 times in Scripture. And the verb form is used 8 times, past tense, circumcised, 48 times. So there's a lot of both figurative and literal use uh, in its implications here. The physical act is only a symbol, it's only a symbol of some right of membership, whereas circumcision of the heart is not physically manifested, but is an outward appearance of appearance in the way that we live our obedience. So if you're given over to and follow Christ, I can, if you're living it out, see your circumcised heart. Mark. I know you well enough that I can see your circumcised heart. I don't have to know it. I just know that it's there. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. 
Scripture shows us two sides of the physical side of circumcision. It's either pride or despised. So a good verse for pride would be in Genesis 34. Um, you can go there if you want. Uh, it's, it's the Dinah incident uh, via the massacre at Shechem. Um, Shechem violates Jacob's daughter, Dinah. I don't know if you recall that. Jacob's sons are revenge-driven. Uh, Hamor says, give us your sons, and we'll give you our daughters, and we can marry and live happily ever after. And Jacob's sons say, and you can see the pride right here they have, we cannot do this thing to give our sister one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. So how dare us? There's no way we could do that. And obviously they trick them into doing that. They circumcise them all. Go ahead. Uh, Genesis 34, 14. And if you want to see one for um, being despised, one more sentence. So by law, that's correct. They had to have, they had him, by law, that was correct. But they, had they had circumcised hearts, it may have been different. But you can feel the pride, obviously a false pride, as they had an ulterior motive. And the whole motive was to circumcise them, and then on the third day they go in and slaughter them all while they're all suffering from being circumcised. And in terms of being despised, you can feel the temp, contempt and uh, repugnance here. First Samuel 27, you don't have to go there. Then David spoke to the men who were saying, who stood by him saying, this is when David and, uh, is going up against Goliath. So David standing there, all his men there. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done with this man who kills this Philistine, for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that they should defy the armies of the living God? So you can see um, there's a bit of discontent there. One can be construed that, and, oh, and Pastor um, Anthony mentioned one in Judges 14.3 on Sunday. And this kind of falls into both the pride and uh, despised. Uh, Samson, this is his father and mother, said to him, There's no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among the people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines. You can see that they're, one, prideful, uncircumcised Philistines. That's the best you can do. So they, that's both, uh, both rounds there. You can hear the disapproval and the contempt. All right, so changing gears a little bit, one of the more humorous events. Uh, Numbers 11.20. Eating quail till it comes out your nose. All right, number 11, Numbers 11 takes us through some hard words, but a rather poignant look at human nature. So I'll set this up a little bit. So the Israelites have been out there for almost two years. They've had, they have the ark and the tabernacle. Uh, they have the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. So they're settling into a bit of a groove, you'd think. But like any good road trip, the grumbling has to start at some point. Interestingly, it's not that the Israelites who started it. Scripture says it was some of the sojourners. Scripture calls them a mixed multitude. So you would have had some Egyptians in there who realized at the point of the plagues that the Hebrew God was very powerful, and Pharaoh got it way wrong. So they would have followed the lead and observed the Passover, and they would have been spared. They would, not had some, they would have had some slaves, as well as a general small number of non-Israelites. So in Numbers, four, 11, Numbers 11, 4 through 6, if you want to follow along, you there? Numbers 11, 4 through 6. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yield to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing to, act, nothing to eat except this manna before our eyes. So the Israelites jump on board with the um, people who are not Israelites. And... 
it looks like manna cakes and muffins got old pretty quick, so it's almost two years. I would think they would. So do you know what the word manna means, translated from Hebrew? What is it? So they come out to tent the very first morning, and they look down and say, what is it? <laughs> so interesting conversations probably sprung up. Somebody said, can I get, what, are, what is it, please? What is it? You know, that's what I said. I said, what is it? You can almost imagine one of those who's on first kind of conversations to go through something like that. So they're complaining about absolutely miraculous provisions of God, and God gets angry about it. So Moses is really perturbed. Go to Numbers 11, and we're going to read through verses 11 through 15. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant, and why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laid this burden on me, all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them? And you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat and give, to give all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. Am I not able to bear? I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. All right, that's quite the rant on Moses' part. Uh, Moses has been listening to them for a year and a half plus. Uh, he's had enough. God is gracious to tell him to pick 70 people to assist him going forward. And then here it comes. Look at Numbers 11, 19, and 20. Just over a couple of verses. You shall eat not one day, not two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you, have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come up out of Egypt? I don't know if you've ever had anything where you eat it that long. It's just like, I cannot eat another bite of that. <laughs> lobster, yes. B believe it or not, Michelle, you has lobster. When we were down in the Caribbean, we had lobster every night for about a week, every way you could want it. Boil it, boil it, poach it, grill it, salad it, whatever. I finally said, I'm sorry, I can't eat another lobster. So this is one of those things. But you have to eat it for a month? I mean, it probably would have come out of my nose. So lessons learned, uh, at least we forget. I do not think any of us is missing any meals. We live obscene lifestyles. Um, I'm always grateful that for what we have every day to eat. And many on earth are not so fortunate. Uh, many of people eat the same thing every day, day after day after day, after day. Especially the people who are eating staples like just rice and things of that nature. And there's a lot more in that chapter that are often missed. I didn't realize um, as many times as I've been through the book of Numbers, there's actually a fire in verse 1 and an undefined plague in verse 33. Talk, doesn't talk about how many people died in the plague, but it looked like it was pretty serious, and the fire was pretty, uh, pretty strange outside the camp. So interesting things if you want to dig into that, a fire and a plague. One of my favorites, and I've used this event to engage old people in Old Testament intri intrigue. For many people, the Old Testament is that dusty, dry stuff grandma would read. I personally like the events in Old Testament. A little commentary here, and I said before, stop calling them stories. These are events. They actually did take place. I fall to the, pray, the same things. If, if you catch me saying story, you can call me out. Um, the book of Judges, chapter 4. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Okay, at this point in history, a prophetess named Deborah was the judge over Israel, and people went to, their, to her in matters of justice. I'm going to begin, I'm going to have to paraphrase all this stuff because it takes chapters to unfold what's taking place here. Uh, she summons a man named Barak, who God chose to be the leader of Israel's army against the Canaanites. Uh, the Canaanite commander was Sisera, a powerful but cruel man. And Barak tells Deborah, if you go with me in battle, I will, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. Deborah agrees to go, but tells Barak that because of the way he responded to God's call, there would be no glory for him in Sisera's defeat. In fact, God is going to sell Sisera into the hands of a woman instead and gave her the glory. 
sell sister into the hand of a woman instead and give her the glory. So let's start reading in verses uh, 14 through 21. Judges 4, 14 through 21. So the children of Israel served Eglon. I'm not in the right spot. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is a day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak perused, pursued the chariots and the army as far as that place, Herosheth Hagaim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, and not a man was left. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Haber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Habar, the, Habar the, Kenite, the Kenite. Jael, Jabel, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, and do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. And then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the door of the tent, and if a man comes and inquires of you, and say, Is there a man here? You should say no. Then Jael, Haber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. So she nailed him to the ground with a tent peg. <laughs> All right. So we don't know if she had foreknowledge that she would kill him or not. Um, God revealed it and presented it to her. And as an interesting, um, I looked it up to see who all these people were. Habar the Kenite is the son of Hobab, who was the father-in-law of Moses. So that's why Jael and Sisera really would have been not at war with one another. And it would have been safe for him to go into a tent of a woman. One, he wouldn't go into a tent of a woman normally, somebody else's wife. And two, a woman wouldn't have a weapon. So he felt he was safe there. But God's in control, right? But it was still a brave act, and Sister would have known that she had no weapon. Uh, there was a degree of safety going into a woman's tent. Um, but Scripture predicted it in verse 9. God was going to sell Sisera into the hands of a woman instead and give her the glory. And at some point, um, the Holy Spirit moved in Sisera. And another reason it was so powerful for her, at this time in history, women raised and broke camp. She, they, broke, they, they put the tents up, not the men. So she was intimate with a peg and a hammer. And those tents are huge. When we went to Israel, we spent some time out with the um, uh, Bedouins. Thank you. And they're made out of goat hair. There's, it's not like canvas. So these things are really heavy. So these women are out there, and they're like, you know, putting these things up. So not to be messed with. Never sleep with a woman who knows how to use a hammer and a tent peg. All right, so uh, next one. Uh, this one's inconceivable at first glance. Um, Elisha's ministry, at the beginning of this, turned to 2 Kings. Second Kings 2, 23 and 24. 2, 23. First time I read this, I was just like, what in the heck is going on here? So, uh, again, at the beginning of Elisha's ministry, Elijah has just been taken out. Uh, so, and when he, uh, Elisha, when he went up there from, to Bethel, and he was going up on the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him, and they said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. So he turned around, looked at them, and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord, and two female bears come out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youth. That seems rather harsh, does it not? Two bears come out and kill 42 kids? 
That seems rather harsh. All right, but you gotta dig into this a little bit deeper because there's um, some of the translations, it doesn't really work as well as you think it does in English. So you figure out where I'm at here. All right, so Elijah's walking down the road and some youths are calling his, calling his name. A bear comes out, scriptures says it's youths. So you get the picture of a bunch of eight, and ten year, eight to ten year olds, maybe a bunch of twelve year olds, you know, something of that age. But actually in Hebrew, the word for youths can imply a male between 12 and 20. So this could have been a cadre of rowdy boys or even bandits out on the highway. Uh, consider in these times too, uh, a 15 to 18 year old boy then was far, far different than one we would have nowadays. Our generation X and Z boys would generally be like babies to these guys. So what they were doing was making fun of his baldness. Now, we don't know if it's male pattern baldness or maybe it's partially bald, or even he shaved it as a sign of being a prophet. That's what I think it was. Uh, and they were saying, go up, go up. They were telling him to go up as in the way of Elijah or just die. Either way, you do not chide or make fun of God's anointed. Elijah cursed them in the name of the Lord. So Elijah was leaving it up to God to deal with them. It wasn't Elijah that called it out and said to the bear. Elijah said, Lord, deal with this. It was the Lord who sent the bear to annihilate those children. <clears throat> Not Elijah. So maybe we give this a broader look, and it seems a little less objectionable if we look at it in that context. This is not a bunch of youths, as it says. We were teasing a bald guy. It was a more threatening group of young men wishing God's chosen prophet were dead so that he would not be pointing out and calling them out in their sin and their idolatry, because that's really what was taking place in that part of the country at that time. So there's probably a dozen more we could look at, it and it's simply amazing. Uh, so the sun and the moon stand still for almost a day in Joshua 10. That's pretty amazing. Good story. I like Absalom getting caught, his hair caught. Do what? Story. <laughs> Did I say story? Yes. There you go. It, we do it so often. We do can't call them stories. I like Absalom getting caught by his hair and hanging midair in 2 Samuel. Not a fan of Absalom, but I was a big fan of Joab early on. He was David's enforcer, but sadly he slipped into a, a bit of pride. And after getting word and knowing David said not to hurt Absalom, he ran him through with three spears. So David as well, uh, Joab grew to be a disappointment on him. And on his deathbed, he informed Solomon, his son, not to let Joab's gray hair take him to the grave, which is code word for get rid of him. So that was a good story. Uh, I like it when they use the word when story. See, thank you. But I mean that that's how that's how it is. That's how pervasive it is. And I, it, it it's a true story. It's a true story. But it's really history. And a lot of this stuff can be charted in history. It really it's amazing that that we can do that. Um, I like when scripture uses the word smote. We could use some a little more smoting these days, right? Ananias and Sapphira smoted, pff, right? We could use some of that. Um, this is an actually, this is probably the most sickening story to me in all of scripture. Judges 19, the Levite priest concubine is dismembered and 12 parts sent out to all through Israel. That's a terrible story. Um, how could you give anyone over to be used in that manner? And it's similar to, and it's the same homosexual component as Sodom and Gomorrah, where the men try to break down the door and have relations with the male visitor. Uh, these two events, not stories, <laughs> and then go to read Romans 1, and you, how you can compare the two, I do not know. Uh, a month or so ago, Pastor Darren told me of a pastor who intimated that Scripture only whispers in homosexuality being wrong. I don't know how you can go that way, that route. If there's a component in this event, in any of these events, that's positive, it's that this and a number of other events in Israel's story speak of the validity of Scripture in Israel. Israel would in no way place some of these events in Scripture if it were up to the men. Israel would want a more positive view of who they were. So, so again, while these entire events, events, not stories, Fires at times where <clears throat> traverse multiple chapters, you don't typically get anyone calling you out after you tell these kinds of stories to anybody, making offhanded remarks. Hmm? Stories. Stories. <laughs> okay, I promise I'll say stories a few more times. So, however, sometimes I use these, or I catch people with 
one-off verses, and I'll give you an example. So casual Christians or make-believers will toss out a verse, and it's a great teaching opportunity. Here's an example. Uh, a couple months ago, there were, and this happened a few times at work, a couple, two, three of us will be chatting together at break time or whatever, and it'll turn to things of scripture or spiritual things. And sort of when I get done, I say, okay, church is over. So this happened one time, and the gentleman said, where two are gathered, wherever two are gathered together. And I, I was like, do you know that that's really a verse about church, about discipline, specifically church discipline? And he was just like, what? So I gave him a little work to do. I said, go home, check that out, read it, and come back, we'll talk about it. So he had no idea. They, people just toss these verses out there because they hear them and say, you know, wherever two or more are gathered, they think they're having church. Well, they are, maybe, but the bottom line is, scripturally, that's a verse on discipline. Another verse I'm willing to take a swing at is uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you can't. Um, you're not going to play in the NBA or the NFL. You're not going to play at Carnegie Hall. There's a whole list of things that you are simply not going to transpire in your life no matter what. And I get the broader societal implications. If you and I are speaking, I get what you're saying. If you say all things work together for good, I get that. If you and, my, if you and I were talking about that, I would understand that. So let's go there because I want to show you how this could read. This will give you some ammo if you want to run this off to somebody. Philippians 4. Okay, so we're going to start in verse uh, 12. No, let's go 11. All right, so Philippians 4, 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, which is live humbly. I know how to abound, so live in prosperity. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to both abound and to suffer. I can do all, this is why you should insert the word these, I can do all these things, these things referenced in verse 12. I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you want to read something and read them together, I like verse 13 and 19 together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So those two, 13 and 19, they go really well together. Just, again, just me. Um, Romans 8, 28 and I caught somebody on this one just uh, about a week or so ago. All things work together for good, period. That's all they said. All things work together for good. And I said, do you know what the rest of that verse says? No. <laughs> well, and if you call people out, all things work together for, for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. So if you love the Lord and you're called according to his purposes, then things might, all things might work out to good. Even if they don't appear to be working out to good, it's going to be for the good. So there's actually two qualifiers there. You have to love God and you have to be called according to his purpose. If you are called out and according to God's purpose, it may work out. So that's one of those other ones. Um, that's a slow pitch down the middle. If they're going to give me 828 and just say all things work together for good, I'm going to come right at them. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm not a hard-nosed guy. I, I, I'm gentle with people. Sometimes there's no context for you to go where you want to go like that. But there's some people at work that, um, casual Christians, if you want to call them like that, you know, they, don't, they, don't, they, they can say these verses, but they don't really understand what they are. They, don't, they can't even complete them. They don't have any context in which to use them. So if you're going to, like I say, if you're going to give me a slow pitch like that, I'm going to write it right back to you. Um, my last job, I worked 15 years in the same place. I supported 250 people. I was in a lot of cubes and a lot of offices over 15 years. Um, there was one Bible verse that was on almost every plaque or a wall hanging or a desk ornament or whatever that was out there by a factor of 10. Can you tell me what it would be? Out loud, somebody say. Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. All right, a lot of discussions emanated from that one over 15 years. One lady went home, called her son, who was a pastor at a Baptist church. He emailed me and was in some degree of disagreement with my negativity and was over, I felt he was over contextualizing it. Um, I felt he was uh, putting eisegesis information into the text. He was taking, putting his own spin on the text, making it say what he wanted it to say. Uh, the word of faith, love, they love that verse, especially the word prosper. They miss the fact that it's not worldly prosperity, it's spiritual prosperity. So again, you've got to be, if you're going to go at these people, you have to have some context behind what it is you're going to say to counter when they give you a verse, because these are verses people will, they'll throw them up to you all the time. And there's a lot of opportunities that come our way, and they will come your way. I'm not out there hacking people up, but if I can rightly engage, I will. I'd let some go because it's simply a little awkward, or indeed it would be out of context. You pray right there and you simply just say, well, okay, well, church is over. So for us, the reason we're here on this planet, glorify God, fulfill his purpose, advance his kingdom. Amen? Amen. All right. That's all I have. Ready for communion? I am. Lord Jesus, we just lift up this time together to you, Lord. We've sat before you. We've opened your word. My feeble little heart and mind, Lord, have uh, tried to put some rationale behind uh, the complexity of your scripture. Forgive me, Lord, for anything I said that was incorrect. May it fall to the ground and never be remembered. So, Lord Jesus, we just uh, lift up the remainder of this service to you. We do indeed do this in memory of you, Lord. That's what you have called us to do. You said to us specifically, do this in remembrance of me. So as we take the time, Lord, to prepare ourselves and stand before you and call out all that is wrong, Lord, in our hearts and our minds, heal us, Lord Jesus. Allow us to come before the table, guilt free. Touch our hearts and our minds, Lord. Allow us to leave here Walking on air, Lord, this being completely new, made afresh and new as we walk out the door. We give you thanks and praise in your name. Amen.